Yeah, hi everybody. Um, so I'm going to do a kind of a PowerPoint here, so I'm, I'll be wandering back and forth. Um, uh, ben, thank you very much for the introduction and also um, for initiating, I believe, the, the invitation here to the Haven Center. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so dog whistle politics, Hakoda racial appeals have reinvented racism and right to middle class. Dog whistle politics, um, it's a term of art. You hear it very often. It's sort of an inside the beltway term. And the idea is that a dog whistle operates on two registers. Uh, human ears can't hear it, but dogs can. And so there's a sense that on one level, uh, uh, racial appeals now are inaudible. That is, they're not expressed. They're not sort of open claims of, of uh, open appeals, express appeals for racial solidarity. On the other hand, on another level, they clearly trade on sort of a racial discourse. And you might think about terms like um, welfare queen or illegal alien. And, and I'll talk some more about both of those terms, but, but I, I suppose for most of us, when we hear welfare queen or illegal alien, the race aspect is really quite salient, but you notice that on the surface, there is no express reference to race. And so this is the notion of dog whistle politics. Here's the claim I'm making. I'm making two claims. One, that it has reinvented racism. And that's really going to be the topic of my, uh, of my discussion tomorrow. So tomorrow I'm going to explain how racism has shifted since the civil rights era in a way that has allowed politics to be mobilized around racial appeals at the very same time that most people uh, uh, understand themselves to be completely against racism. And I include most, uh, almost all whites um, are completely against racism and yet and we'll talk about the numbers, but let's say 60% are responding to this sort of, of coded appeal. Okay, um, the topic for today is wreck the middle class. Now, others have noted, I mean, you know, dog whistle politics, it's a, it's a contemporary term. Others have noted that the Republican Party continually engages in these sorts of racial appeals. Indeed, um, uh, two different chairs of the Republican National Committee have admitted to this and apologized for it. And then it just starts up again, right? So it's not, it's not as if this is a secret. People know that these sort of coded racial appeals are out there. But what nobody's really doing is connecting it up to uh, the crisis of the middle class today. And that's really the, the point that I want to drive home. And I want to tell a story in which coded race baiting, racial demagoguery over the last 50 years, helps us understand why today um, we are in the you know, sort of still enduring uh, the vestiges of the Great Recession, um, why we are seeing levels of wealth inequality uh, greater than we've seen in 100 years, um, uh, why it is that in the 1970s the average CEO made 40 times what the average worker made, but now that, that, now that figure is about 353, right? So today, the average CEO makes every day what the average worker makes. Why is that? I want to say, it's due in significant part to coded racial appeals. Okay, um, so let me see. How am I going to start? Oh, so what are the and forthcoming book title? Uh, I mean, a cover, postcards. I'm going to pass these around. <laughs> the, the book is going to be out in January, so this is you can pre-order on Amazon. But otherwise, this is as close as you're going to get until January. Okay, but so these are the postcards. All right, here's how I want to start. Barry Goldwater. Some of you recognize him. <laughs> Okay, here's what I want to say about Barry Goldwater. I want to tell two stories about Barry Goldwater. I want to tell a political story and a racial story. Here's the, here's the political story. Barry Goldwater was on the fringes of American politics insofar as he opposed the New Deal. So let's go back. Um, a hundred years ago, you had the, 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 the sort of concentrated wealth that effectively controlled the state, um, uh, controlled the regulatory apparatus, it ensured low taxes, it ensured very few protections for working people, it ensured that the state was not um, engaged in uh, uh, protection of workers or in trying to create a middle class, and the result was the Great Depression. And with the Great Depression, you get a new sort of <coughs> political liberalism that understands that the state has some very important roles to play and that the, that the state, first and foremost, that the state has a role in protecting people from the vicissitudes of either personal misfortune, falling ill, a death in the family, or also large-scale misfortunes, right, like economic calamity, that the, that the state has, should provide a, a, a safety net. 
But beyond that, there's a sense that the state has an important role to play in creating routes of upward mobility. You may all recognize this stuff as everything that's just gone away in Wisconsin, <laughs> right? But, but they, so, so routes of upward mobility, which include primarily education, but also job training uh, uh, and also mortgage assistance, that the state also has a role to play in regulating the marketplace preventing environmental abuses, preventing labor abuses, that the state has a role to play in regulating concentrations of wealth, and it can do so through progressive taxation and the downward distribution of wealth. Right? So that's the New Deal consensus. And it was a broad-based consensus, so broad that from 1952 to 1960, I mean, you have the FDR and the New Deal and whatnot, but then you have Eisenhower, who's a Republican, but he's a moderate Republican who actually embraces the ethos of the New Deal and expands Social Security. Right? Still, you have some fringe figures, like Barry Goldwater, scion of a wealthy family in Arizona. He was, and I've got this picture up here. Though he was a scion of a wealthy retail family in Arizona, he fancied himself a cowboy, not just sort of in the love the outdoor life of Arizona, but also in the sort of Marlboro man, rugged individual, ideological sense that everybody should be responsible for themselves and that the state had no role taking care of people. And in fact, that when the state took care of people, it infantilized them, right? So this is not just, this is not just howdy y'all. This is an ideological pose of the rugged individual, okay? And this, so this is Barry Goldwater. Now, there's no chance that he's going to win election and that this sort of, of uh, sort of marginal ideology is going to win election. Um, in fact, in 1960, it's Richard Nixon who'd been Eisenhower's vice president running against John F. Kennedy. N Nixon is a Republican <laughs> moderate, you know, committed to the New Deal and he, and he loses right, uh, 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 barely uh, to JFK. But there's a sense that there's no political room for this sort of politics. That's the policy story, now the racial story. How would they create room? Goldwater in 1961 says, we need to win some votes. And the way we're going to win some votes is in terms of taking advantage of the growing racial crisis of, that is resulting from the civil rights movement. And so he's got this wonderful quote in which he says, we are not going to win the Negro vote. So we might as well go hunting where the ducks are, which is to say, you might as well start attacking blacks as a way to win white votes. You don't need the black vote, and you're going to pick up a lot of white votes. So that's 1961. By 1963, that position had gained sufficient force within the Republican Party that there was a faction um, on the cusp of becoming a dominant faction that decided that in fact, well, I need to, re I mean, let me read you this quote, because I, I can't do it justice. This is a quote, uh, Robert Novak attended the 1963 Republican National Convention, and this is what, what, what Robert Novak reported. A good many, perhaps a majority of the party's leadership, envisioned substantial political gold to be mined in the racial crisis by becoming in fact, though not in name, the white man's party. Remember, one astute party worker said quietly, this isn't South Africa. The white man outnumbers the Negro nine to one in this country. Right, so in 1963, you've got a faction of the Republican Party, indeed perhaps the majority, that's saying to itself, we can win votes by appealing to whites. We should become the white man's party in fact, but not in name. There's a purposeful strategy of appealing to whites. This is an important turning point, and I want to be clear that this is a turning point. Where were the parties in terms of race up to this point? Both parties had, had progressive and reactionary elements. Within the Republican Party, you had reactionary elements like Barry Goldwater and other conservatives who were quite, quite reactionary on racial issues. On the other hand, you had racial progressives within the Republican Party who were appalled by this sort of strategy. Within the Democratic Party, you had a New Deal coalition that depended upon Northeast elites, the white working class, and also black support uh, outside of the South. Right. In 1962, when the American public was asked, which of the, oh sorry, you had that in the Democratic Party, and then you had the Southern Democrats. 
And the Southern Democrats in 1962 were the white man's party, in fact and in name. They made no bones about being a segregated whites only political party, right? So both parties had progressive and reactionary elements. In 1962, if you asked Americans which party was most likely to help the Negro, about 22% said Democrats, about 22% said Republicans, and the remainder couldn't tell the difference. Right? That, and and uh, you, know, you might have asked them, um, which party of force to it was going to do anything? Right? I mean, no, nobody thought either party was going to be particularly aggressive, but nobody saw a distinction between the parties. By 1964, 70% would say the Democrats, and about 10% would say the Republicans. Why? Because Barry Goldwater. Because by 1964, when Barry Goldwater becomes a Republican nominee, he begins to campaign on racial issues in a way that makes it clear that the Republican Party is hostile to black interests and solicitous of whites. And so the, uh, the, the alignment, the realignment that we have now between a Democratic Party that is associated with minorities and a GOP that's associated with whites, it doesn't exist in 62. It's solid by 64. right? And, and this is why. Okay, so how does, how does Goldwater campaign? In the South, he campaigns essentially on three issues. First, he campaigns on states' rights. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the term, but in the South, in 1964, no one could fail to understand what states' rights meant. States' rights meant the right of Southern states to resist federal pressure to end school segregation. Right? States' rights was a term that had come out from the antebellum South as a defense of the Southern right to maintain slavery, and then during the Reconstruction era as a repudiation of federal rule in the South. And in the era after Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 ordered an end to school segregation, states' rights enjoyed a resurgence as a very powerful and emotional language saying the South should be left alone to continue segregation. And Barry Goldwater campaigns on the basis of a claim for states' rights. His second big point that he wants to make is freedom of association. Again, no surface reference to race, but no one in the South could fail to understand that freedom of association meant the right of white business owners to exclude blacks, exclude them from restaurants, from theaters, uh, 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 in terms of segregate them in transportation. Freedom of association meant the right of whites to exclude blacks. Right? So those are two issues. Uh, third, Barry Goldwater in the summer of 1964, so, so one of the big legacies of 1964, and you're going to hear a lot about this because we're coming up on the 50th anniversary, is the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Right? Um, after uh, uh, JFK is assassinated in the fall of 63, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson says, we need to fulfill his legacy, we need to pass this Civil Rights Act. Um, uh, it takes six months of, of arm wrestling for LBJ to get it through Congress. Barry Goldwater votes against it. And he campaigns in the South as someone who has opposed the Civil Rights Act. Right? So he's got states' rights, freedom of association, voted against the Civil Rights Act. Some of that might have been just too subtle. So I've got to tell you this other story about Goldwater. In the South, he would go to football stadiums. There's a story about him, in particularly in Montgomery, Alabama. And he would have the football stadiums, the floor of the football stadiums, festooned with white lilies. And in Montgomery, Alabama, 700 white women in white gowns. And then he would stride out onto the football field and talk about states' rights and freedom of association and voting against the Civil Rights Act. Right? So if those terms were too subtle, you, no one could fail to understand that he was setting himself up as a defender of white womanhood in the South. Right? White, a field of white lilies. White women in white gowns. Well, you just the imagery is just I couldn't. I can't find a photo of it. Oh my God! But anyway, okay. Um, uh, so he's campaigning on race. He's also campaigning as an opponent of the New Deal. So, for example, uh, uh, Tennessee Valley Authority had brought electricity to millions in the South, right? Uh, uh, Goldwater's campaigning in the South, saying that he would abolish the Tennessee Valley Authority. Right, he's, a, he's campaigning against the New Deal. He's campaigning against Social Security. Um, uh, he's campaigning against welfare. He's campaigning against state regulation of the market, saying it's a threat to democracy. All this. Okay, so what happens? What happens in terms of the 1964 election? This is the electoral map. Blue is Johnson. 
Johnson represents the New Deal. Lyndon Johnson is campaigning for an expansion of the New Deal, and Johnson <coughs> wins everywhere in the country, except Arizona, and except five deep south states. And how are we to understand this? Most people in 1964 understood this as a final death knell of sort of economic conservatism, as a final proof that New Deal liberalism had triumphed across the country. Except that there's a warning there in that red in the Deep South. Because when you think about the Deep South, there are two things happening here. One, the Deep South was deeply committed to New Deal liberalism. The Deep South, more than the North, had benefited from, from the New Deal and its programs and massive federal investment. And yet, here they're voting against it. And two, Goldwater was a Republican. And you've got to understand that in the South, generations of whites had grown up hating the Republicans, hating them. Right? And, and, and they didn't just hate them because of the Civil War and because of Reconstruction. They hated them because they blamed Brown versus Board of Education on the Republican Party. Earl Warren, the Chief Justice, was a Republican appointee. And the person who ordered troops into Little Rock was Eisenhower, a Republican president. They loathed the Republican Party. And they voted Republican. And so the warning is that coded racial appeals could get even the most loyal Democrats even those most committed to New Deal liberalism to vote for an economic conservative Republican if they understood that that person represented their racial interests. And that's the warning of 1964. Okay. Whoa! <laughs> now I suppose all of you recognize, there he is. This campaign in Philadelphia in 1968, right? This is the moderate Richard Nixon wins the Republican campaign. Now, uh, now in 64, this is a warning, but it's not clearly heard. Nixon continue, ca starts his campaign in 1968 as an economic uh, liberal, as sort of, a, sort of a New Deal Republican. Indeed, he has a proposal for a flat wealth transfer to the poor. Right? Instead of the, I mean, it's just an amazing sort of activist government vision. Okay, so. But he's running neck and neck with Hubert Humphrey. And to his right, he's being flanked by another Southern politician who's running hard on racial issues, George Wallace. And late in the campaign, in October of 1968, Nixon makes the decision that he needs to shift and start picking up uh, uh, the votes of racially anxious whites. And he does so by shifting to a couple of uh, different terms. He starts coming out against so it turns out he's already cut a backroom deal with Strom Thurmond in the South in which he promised Strom Thurmond that he would slow or stop uh, federal uh, uh, efforts to promote integration in the South. Now he goes public and he makes that promise to the country as a whole. Right? In October 1968 he says, I'm going to stop. The federal government is, pr is pushing too fast on school integration in the South. I'm going to slow it down. So he makes that promise publicly. And then he also begins to campaign against what he calls forced busing. And forced busing, now, people have been busing their children forever to schools, but forced busing <coughs> is a euphemism for buses that take white children to black schools or that take black children into white schools. Forced busing is a euphemism for integration in the North. And Nixon comes out against forced busing. Right? So he's going to slow integration in the South, he's going to slow school integration in the North, and he also begins to campaign on law and order. And he, started, he has these really effective campaign commercials that say, law and order, first right of every American. And then privately, <coughs> watching his own TV commercial about law and order, he says to one of his aides, this ad hits it right on the head. It's all about those damn Negro and Puerto Rican groups. Right? So he, so, so he begins to campaign, again, as a dog whistle politician, forced busing, slow school integration, law and order, all of these coded terms. <coughs> but this is 1968. He barely wins. And it's just not clear whether the race baiting was essential or not. Meanwhile, Democratic pollsters and also a Republican pollster, a Republican sort of strategist, are crunching the numbers. And it's important that Democratic pollsters came to the same conclusion, but more importantly is that the Republican strategist, his name is Kevin Phillips. And he published his book in 1970 called The Emerging Republican Majority. And what Phillips says, point blank, is 
American politics is based upon group antipathies. To the extent that the Democrats have started to reach out to blacks, whites are going to lead that party in droves. We can win without any black support if only we start to appeal to whites. <clears throat> And in 1970, reading that and hearing the same thing from the Democratic pollsters. Democratic pollsters aren't saying, you know, their prescription is we need to distance ourselves from blacks, otherwise we're going to go down in defeat. But hearing that from both camps, Nixon shifts to the right racially. And he shifts to the right also in terms of his policy. So his previous sort of progressive policies, he abandons those and he starts to come out much more forcefully in sort of a, a, a reactionary policies. You want to see 1972? In 1964, LBJ had won the support of 65% of whites. In 1972, eight years later, 70% of whites voted for Richard Nixon. And one more thing. 1964 was the last year a Democratic presidential candidate won the majority of the white vote. Since, right? Not since 1964. Not since LBJ in 1964 has a Democratic presidential candidate won a majority of the white vote. And you might be thinking Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton. They came within a few percentage points. They almost split the white vote. And we should be clear, they almost split the white vote because they ran as Southern whites and they themselves used coded racial appeals, and we can talk about more, more about that in questions and answers if you want. But, but not since 1964 has a Democratic presidential candidate won a majority of the white vote. Right? And, and this, is, this is a remarkable shift. Now, people are going to start telling a story in which the country, tired of the excesses of the New Deal, returns to its conservative roots. I don't think the shift from 64 to 72 in eight short years is about exhaustion with liberalism. I think it's about the power of coded racial appeals. Right? And that's the story I want to tell. Okay. Ronald Reagan. He never was a policy moderate. Well, he was before he got into politics. But once he got into politics after his stint with GE, by the time he gets into politics, He's a Goldwater Republican, right? He's against an activist state. He's against welfare. He's against public education. He's against unions. He's against legal aid to poor people. I mean, it's, I mean, all the way down. He's a for massive tax cuts for the rich, right? He's always been an economic conservatism, conservative, and he always understood the power of racial provocation to get elected. So that in 1968, when he was running for governor in California, he made a big point of coming out against a California law that would have prevented housing segregation. And he, actually, he campaigned saying, whites have the right to discriminate against blacks if they want. Actually, he didn't say whites, sorry. Homeowners. Homeowners have the right to discriminate against blacks if they want. Right. So this is 68. This is Reagan in 1980. Now, part of the reason he's going to win is in the context of sort of all the other economic turmoil and the international turmoil. He's got that bright, sunny, avuncular personality. But also through racial appeals. This is Ronald Reagan. He has won the Republican nomination. He is going to be the Republican nominee for president in 1980. And this is his first official campaign stop. Right, as, the, as the nominee, and this is Philadelphia, Mississippi. This is where he starts his campaign. And you may know Philadelphia, Mississippi, because 16 years earlier, I mean, we say 64 and 64, that sounds so long ago, but it's 16 years earn, earlier. You had Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner, <clears throat> civil rights workers who'd gone down for Freedom Summer to, to, to help um, uh, enfranchise blacks. They were arrested by the local sheriff, uh, and then the local sheriff participated in the lynch mob. They were all executed, and then they were buried, and a month later, their bodies were found. This is Philadelphia, Mississippi in 1964, and there isn't a voter alive in 1980 when Reagan gets there, in 1980, who wasn't alive in 1964. Right? It's, 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 it's only been 16 years. 
Reagan draws a crowd of 20,000 whites, and before that crowd, he says, I am for states' rights. And there is no accident when Reagan begins his campaign in the South, in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and comes out to this crowd and says, I'm for states' rights. He is clearly engaging in this sort of politics of racial provocation <coughs> and communicating a very strong sort of racial position against blacks, against civil rights, and in favor of, of, of even a violent reaction to states' rights. Okay, so there's this. Then there's Welfare Queen. Reagan constantly tells a story of a Chicago welfare queen, and he's got you know, some made-up numbers, and she's got so many false husbands, and she's collecting Social Security, and so da 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 right? He's always saying that story. Never references race, but doesn't have to, because when people hear Chicago welfare queen, it already generates an image. Or one other one. Reagan on the campaign trail constantly tells a story of some young fellow ahead of you in line buying a T-bone steak with food stamps while you wait to buy hamburger. So some young fellow ahead of you in line buying a T-bone steak with food stamps while you wait to buy hamburger. First time he told that story, he told it in the South, and instead of some young fellow, he said some young buck. Right? And some of you may recognize the term. It's a term that comes out of the South. It's got some national uh, resonance. It means, or connoted, especially during the slavery era, Especially, especially a strong uh, black man who resisted white authority and lusted after white women. That was the connotation of some young buck. Now that was too close to a sort of a racist statement, so we switched to some young fellow. But people understood the sort of racial dynamics of a claim of somebody on food stamps buying T-bone steak while you're getting hamburger. And the resonance was, it's constituting both blacks and whites. It's constituting blacks as lazy welfare cheats who are getting far more than they deserve, but it's also constituting whites as victims, as hardworking, as the taxpayers who are being ripped off. Right? And this is sort of how Reagan was campaigning uh, in 1980. The Willie Horton ads. Um, Reagan, as an economic conservative, passes the largest tax cuts, uh, corporate taxes, tax cuts for the rich of the country had theretofore seen. Um, he also begins a massive military buildup. He deregulates the financial sector. It leads to an implosion of the savings and loan market, and the country enters a recession. And he also embroils the country in illegal foreign wars. I don't know if and it sounds familiar, but this is what happens in eight years of Reagan's misrule. Right? I mean, it's sort of, he's been resurrected, he's been, he's been deified in part by Obama, by the way, right? But, but Reagan was really quite unpopular at the end of his term, and so was his vice president, George Bush. George Bush, in fact, at one point was running 15 points behind his Democratic opponent, Michael Dukakis. What turned it around? This ad. So Willie Horton was a bad person. He was a convicted murderer. Uh, he was in jail in Massachusetts. Massachusetts had a program whereby it would furlough prisoners. And you can, you can understand the furlough program. This is back in the days when we believed in rehabilitation. And the idea of a furlough was you allow people to maintain contact with their families and with their communities so that once they're released, they're reintegrated more easily and don't immediately uh, uh, fall back into a life of crime and end up back in prison. Right? And now we've gotten rid of that and in fact, uh, you know, I don't know, some of the statistics suggest like upwards of 30% 30, 30 of the people in prison now are, sort of are, are, are there having on, on like parole violation, right? That this, this is, but but there, is, there are no furlough programs anymore. Part of the reason why not this. So Massachusetts had a furlough program. The, the legislature passed a, passed a law saying that furlough should not be allowed for murderers. Dukakis, as governor, vetoed that legislation. That meant that he was partially responsible when Horton, on furlough, escaped, um, invaded a home of a young couple, bound the man, and uh, beaten bound the man, and twice raped the woman. But it's not that narrative that really made this story so powerful. Rather, it was that Horton was black and that the couple was white. 
right? And so this is the ad, the, 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 the mug shot, um, and then it would, it would flash between these two frames. And this would be one frame, and the next would flash this frame, and then well, this is the, the arrest of Horton, and then kidnapping, stabbing, raping, right? Um, this is a quote worth reading. Again, no surface reference to race, and yet this is what one of, so that Lee Atwater was responsible for this is, uh, but, but this isn't a Lee Atwater quote. This is a quote from another Bush advisor. Willie Horton has star quality. Willie's going to be furloughed to terrorize again. He's a wonderful mix of liberalism and a big black rapist. Right? And in the month that, that in, the, in the first month after this campaign commercial came out, 12% of the electorate shifted their support from Dukakis to Bush. And Bush ended up winning that election in 1988. Um, and there are very few sort of political historians who don't think that this wasn't instrumental in his winning that election. OK. I want to pause here just for a moment. This could go in tomorrow's talk. I want to put it here, give you a sense. How does this work? Never mentioned race, right? Although race was front and center in the narrative. Late in October, now the Democrats haven't said anything about this. They're not complaining about race baiting. Late in October of, 19, uh, of, of 1988, Jesse Jackson is finally sick of all of this. And Jesse Jackson says, this is an ugly racial insinuation. Whereupon the Bush committee, the, 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 yeah, the Bush campaign committee says, that is a sign of desperation on the part of the Democrats to start trying to inject race into the conversation. Right? And I want to say there's three moves here. And I'll talk about them more tomorrow. But there's three basic moves here. And I want to identify them clearly because you see them in almost every conversation about race today. There's the punch, a parry and a kick. The punch, punch race into the conversation through these sorts of coded messages. The parry, <coughs> what race? We didn't say race. <coughs> Point to me where we said race. And if we didn't say the word black <coughs> and nobody used an epithet, then we can't possibly be guilty of racism. Punch Perry, the kick, turn around and attack your accuser of, of opportunistically injecting race into the conversation by accusing you of racism. Right? These are the basic moves in American racial discourse today. Inject race into the conversation constantly. Express outrage that anyone su su suggests that. Defend yourself. Parry any such charge by saying, hey, I never said black. And I didn't use a racial epithet. And then turn around and attack your accuser by saying, Those are the, there go the liberals again, always playing the race card and always trying to trade on these on sort of opportunistic charges of racism. Right? Those are the basic moves. OK. But still, 25 years ago, what about today? So, illegal alien, right? And, and there's an important shift. Uh, so, so, starting about 2001, an important shift in the, in the racial specters, in the racial boogeymen that are being used by a lot of the racial pandering. And you get a shift towards a, 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 a sort of an emphasis on brown foreign, a sort of foreign brown threat. Partly Mexican, partly Muslim. This is the Mexican slide, right? You can see this sense of these invading hordes coming from the southern border. Um, how do you know it's from the southern border? Uh, you, dog, you get the sombrero, right? When we say illegal alien, illegal alien has no reference to race. And yet, it really triggers a very strong sense that this is a southern problem. Um, just an aside, at one, at one point, I have two brothers-in-law at one point. One was doc, uh, dating an undocumented immigrant from Mexico, and the other was a dating an undocumented immigrant from Canada. They had completely different experiences. They could never go and visit her family from Mexico. They traveled back and forth to Canada all the time because she, she was blonde, blue-eyed, and never feared being stopped. Right? So the, the, the whole rhetoric of, undocumented, of illegal alien is about a brown Mexican threat. OK. Ah. Greetings from Topeka, Kansas. Kansas which in 2012 passed a law forbidding any state court from paying attention to Sharia law. Because it's, you know, we're one step closer to burqas than you would think. Right? Sharia law in the heartland. 
ostensibly it's about religion or about behavior. And you hear phrases like, they just don't value human life. Right? You don't hear racial terms, but this is operating as race. This is operating as a threat of, in terms of a threat from a brown other. So this is, okay. But you might say to yourself, okay, this is still on the margins. Um, uh, do we see it in the political discourse? And if I become the nominee, I'm going to take a very simple symbol. I'm going to, I'm going to have food stamps versus paychecks. President Obama is the most effective food stamp president in American history. No president has put more people on food stamps than Obama. Now, this is not an attack, it's a statement. It's not negative, it's a fact. I would like to be the best paycheck president in American history. The most effective food stamp president in American history. Right? And there's that food stamp and blackness being linked again. Um, uh, marginal, yes, but at one point the, the leader in the, in the, federal, in the uh, Republican primaries. Right? But okay, um, John Sununu. <laughs> Co-chair of Mitt Romney's campaign, previously chief of staff in the Bush White House. What people saw last night, I think, was a president that revealed his incompetence, how lazy and detached he is, and how he has absolutely no idea how serious the economic problems of the country are. Governor, I, I want to give you a chance to, to maybe uh, take it back. Did you really mean to call Barack Obama, the president of the United States, lazy? <laughs> yes. I think, it, I, I think you saw him admit it the night before when he delivered the pizzas. He said, you know, they're making me do this work. He didn't want to prepare for this debate. He's lazy and disengaged. So, so, this, is, so this is right after the first presidential debate uh, uh, between Obama and Romney. Um, Obama's performance was poor. This is Sununu's opportunity to explain why. And he says of our first black president, he's lazy and incompetent. Now, Andrea Mitchell would, would subsequently ask whether it was a question of being prepared for the sort of for, for Romney's debate style. And, and Sununu would answer, when you're not that bright, you can't get better prepared. <laughs> right? So he's incompetent, he's lazy, and he's dumb. Right? And this is a co-chair of the Romney campaign. Uh, what about Romney himself? Maybe this is happening, right? Okay, so it's, so it's in politics, but, but is it at the center of it? <laughs> that was one of Romney's major slogans. Mm -hmm. Obama isn't working. Mm -hmm. Right, now, this might, well, okay, whatever. Obama isn't working. I want you to watch this ad. This, this ad, the Romney campaign is going to spend half of its advertising dollars promoting this ad during the summer of 2012. Okay, so there had been a minor change. So, so I mean, one thing you can pick up is th this seems flattering towards Bill Clinton. Well, Bill Clinton, as I said, ran on these dog with themes. One of his themes was his promise to end welfare as we know it. Right? And, so, and so there's a support for Clinton as somebody who is, a, is opposed to welfare, and Clinton was careful to craft that image. There had been a minor change in the welfare program. It had been requested by a number of states, including some with Republican governors, Right? And it really had nothing to do with eliminating the, the, the work requirement. In fact, um, Politifax awarded Romney a pants on fire, one of his little pants on fire awards for this ad. Right? And it was in defense of this ad that a Romney campaign official said, we will not let our campaign be dictated by fact checkers. <laughs> right? It is not, not going to be a reality based campaign, we're going to go with whatever works. But when they went to spend half their dollars, what did they spend it on? They spent it on a claim that, that 
that, that tried to link Obama to welfare. Right? And so, okay, so what I want to suggest here is we're really seeing th that sort of coded race baiting um, that uses terms like you know, illegal alien or Muslim terrorist or welfare or food stamps to, to tarnish minorities and to create a message both of uh, both that there are these lazy minorities who threaten the country and also that there are these hardworking whites who are being victimized, right? The, the, because it works, right? Who works? Whiteness works, right? Okay, so there's that message. But I want to go back and pick up this other element. What does this have to do with policies? There are 47% of the people who have voted for President Trump. Right, Listen to the language. the video, right? The, the, the video was shot surreptitiously while Romney was addressing a $50,000 a plate fundraising event, right? He's talking about the 47% who pay no income taxes. Now, I mean, it's worth pausing to say, yeah, there are 47% or 46% of the Americans who pay no income taxes, but they pay Social Security. Um, uh, uh, they pay uh, Medicare taxes, and that means that an awful lot of them pay upwards of 14% of their total income in taxes, and that means those working Americans are paying more as a percentage of their income than Romney himself. Mm -hmm. right, so we should, we should be clear that there's, a, there's an important sleight of hand when he says they're not paying income taxes. The, the relevant question is what proportion of their income are they paying? What proportion of their total income are they paying? It's, many of them are paying upwards of 14%, and Romney is paying quite a bit less. <coughs> but that's not what's important here. What's important is a couple of things. Think about the language that he's using to describe half the country. He's using the language of welfare, of dependency, of entitlement, and of a lack of personal responsibility. He is blackening whites. He is saying of the poor, He's saying of the bottom half of the country, sorry. He's saying of the middle class, he's saying of the bottom half of the country, you are effectively black, right? You, you, you're on, you believe in welfare, you have an entitlement mentality, you won't take personal responsibility, you think food and health care are things that you're entitled to. Right? That's his language. He's drawing heavily on race to say those people who look to government for help are just like undeserving minorities, right? On one level. Here's the second thing I want to say. Think for a moment about the policies that Romney was espousing, and you will recognize Barry Goldwater. Because Romney is saying, what's his prescription? What's going to get America back on its feet right after the Great Recession? What's his prescription? Massive tax cuts for the rich. Slash social services. A slashed federal government generally. Right? And you'll recognize this in Romney, but you certainly recognize it in his running mate, Paul Ryan. Yes. Right? Slash tax cuts, massive tax cuts for the rich, slash social services, slashed federal government generally, and deregulation of the marketplace. Now, we'd all seen that. We'd seen it prior to the Great Depression. And we saw it with Barry Goldwater, and we saw it again with Romney. Right? And now you might say, okay. This guy is at war against the New Deal, but he lost, and he did, but not among whites. Mm 
not among whites. <coughs> among whites, Romney won the support of 59% of whites. He won the support of 54% of white women. Because right? there's this narrative, oh, there's a gender gap. Which suggests that, and, and you hear people saying, you know, there's not enough middle-aged white guys anymore. The, the New York Times quoted a Republican operative saying, we're in trouble, there's not enough middle-aged white guys. Which suggests it's just middle-aged white guys. Well, he won among 59% of whites. He won among 54% of white women. Among the youngest cohort of white voters, only 42% supported Obama. And across the country, Mitt Romney won a majority of white voters in every state but four. Right? So geographically, in terms of gender, in terms of age, across all of these major demographic dividers is whiteness, more than any of these, that shows us how whites are going to vote in terms of Republican and Democrat. And when they vote Republican, they're voting for precisely the policies that, would un that have been steadily undoing the New Deal and that have led to a new and a sort of resurgent crisis of the middle class. So this, so this is the story I want to tell. Here's the, here's the bottom line for me. And this is you know, more than the theory, more than the narrative. Here's the bottom line. I want people to recognize that if they're concerned about any sort of social problem which could be, be, which could be made better by government involvement, health care, unions, education, immigration, environment, if you care about any sort of social problem that could be made better by government environment, but by government involvement, your efforts are being stymied almost certainly principally in racial terms. Right? So, so when people think about race and politics, they think about poor minorities and what's happening in you know, the, the, the sort of concentrated areas of poverty and sort of minority poverty in Milwaukee or Chicago. And I'm saying no. If you want to understand the fate of the middle class along almost any dimension, you need to understand the continued power of race in society. And I'll, I'll stop there. And I, I actually don't know. <laughs> so happy to take questions. I actually would love to know like, how long we have and what the. Normally we go to 530. Awesome. All right. Could I get the first question? Yeah, sure. So uh, I wonder if you could say. Um, a little bit more about how the the dynamics of the political party and electoral system play into this, and particularly what I would personally characterize as the lack of a really strong opposition party that doesn't ha call the Republican Party out on this in two different ways. One of which is on the racial appeal, they tend to, I think, all too often enable and reinforce this these types of coded racial appeals. So, I mean, and, and also in res with respect to policy. So in 1965, it's LBJ who passes the Federal Assistance to um, Law Enforcement Assistant Act, which is targeted at inner cities primarily, and it's really targeted at African Americans in inner cities. So this is the beginning of the war on crime. Right. Or the fact that, often mis unknown fact, that the first person to use the Willie Horton story was Al Gore in the primaries. Right. Um, or, you know, Clinton's sister soldier right. stuff. And, right. Or Obama's, you know, constant appeal to folks about black people need to take responsibility for themselves. All of that, which I think right. lends to an enabling of this kind of Absolutely. coded appeal. On the other hand, the enabling in the form of, on the economic policies, that these sorts of policies have been implemented over time, not just by Republican administrations, but by Democratic ones, in fact all the sort of hallmarks of Reaganomics were first initiated by Carter in the late 70s and, you know, NAFTA and now the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I mean, all these sorts of things are, you know, there's, a, there's this bigger systemic issue and I, I think it has to do uh, with a lot of factors that are systemic in character uh, rather than, you know, oh, these are bad people versus good people getting into office. Yeah, um, I mean, Th that's right. Although I'd say I'd say race is systemic in character too. And sure. It's not a story yeah. about bad people. Um, uh, but but it, I, I really like your quite your two questions. I, I think they're fantastic. If we step back, you know, we we really need to think about how the Democrats have responded, and then we need to ask why they responded as they did. But in effect, 
The response was set out by these two, uh, Scammon and Wattenberg, by, by these two Democratic pollsters in 1970. Essentially, they said to themselves, well, they, they, they and to the Democratic intelligentsia, we're losing votes on the issue of race. There is a backlash. There is a natural reaction to this, and we need to distance ourselves. And that quickly segued into we can ourselves take advantage of this sort of rhetoric. Um, uh, this has had disastrous consequences for minority communities and for the country as a whole. For minority communities, you absolutely see the rise, for example, of you know, sort of a, a competition between Democrats and Republicans about who can be harder on minorities, whether it's rise of racialized mass incarceration. Um, uh, and, it's, and it's worth pausing here to say, um, you know, there's some very interesting work showing that there's an inverse relationship in Congress between support for civil rights and support for increased funding for police, right? So that the language of law and order becomes the de facto language in which one opposed civil rights, right? So, um, but you can think about racialized mass incarceration. You can think about what's happened to um, the social safety net. You can think about what's happened to education. Those things have harmed the population broadly, but they've harmed the poorest people um, uh, most uh, uh, intensively, and the poorest people are disproportionately people of color. Right? You can also think about mass deportation. So we're deporting people at a rate of around 400,000 a year. That's a, a rate higher than George W. Bush ever did. Uh, uh, we've never in the history of the country seen a sustained rate of deportation this high. And it's because Obama doesn't want to be seen as soft on the immigration issue, right? And now the Republicans are also partly to blame. I was listening to NPR this morning, and I guess they've got this. Um, a Republicans have the, a, a, the, 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 there's a law in the books that require a certain number, that require that beds and detention facilities be filled. And ostensibly, this is to ensure that our immigration laws are enforced. But what this is doing is this is forcing police company, uh, police um, um, officers and ICE officials to arrest undocumented, undocumented immigrants for the most minor of violations, things that would not otherwise lead to arrest or detention, but to actually detain them and incarcerate them in these detention facilities, because there is there is literally a quota mandate. They have to fill these beds, right? So I think that, that, that what you've seen is a democratic response that says, A, let's stay silent and let's not call this out, and B, we can actually do pretty well if we imitated ourselves. And the result has been horrendous for communities of color, but it's also been bad for the country as a whole, for the middle class. Um, let, me, let me switch now to think about this sort of policy, and especially your comment about Carter. Yes, with Jimmy Carter in 1978, you begin to see a shift rightward in terms of economic policy. You begin to see the Democratic Party turning its back on a, a sort of uh, the working man, right? And the, the Democratic Party had had a much stronger identification as, rep as representing the working man against the threat posed by concentrated wealth. And Carter begins to shift that. And how can we understand that? I think it reflects a mobilization on the part of corporations and the rise of think tanks that begins in the very early 1970s. And they begin to have influence that expresses itself in 1978. This is a way of talking about the increasing sort of ideological muscle of corporations and also the increasing penetration of wealth into the democratic system. Are these independent causal factors? Are they separate from, in fact, do they displace race? And I want to say, no, they actually work hand in hand with race. Right? It's the, the, these think tanks are coming up with new arguments uh, for conservative, uh, you know, for cutting taxes, for cutting welfare, for cutting investments in infrastructure. Some of those are couched in racial terms, some are couched in gender terms, some are couched in more libertarian terms, but it's all part of a larger effort for concentrated wealth to reassert itself and to, in a sort of a robust defense of the conservative or the anti-government, the, the big business, small government, of politics of Goldwater that had been defeated. So, yeah, there are these other systemic factors, but I think that it, rather than saying, well, is it one or the other, it's important to see how they're actually working hand in hand. Now, about the Democratic Party, Obama would say right after his reelection, 
the people misunderstood him when they thought that he was a socialist, let alone even a liberal, and he said, if you put my policies back in the 1980s, I was much more like Reagan. And he's right. The whole Democratic Party has shifted to the right. Yet it's still the case that, uh, and this is a, a, a principal political scientist did this work, it's still the case that when you look at the fate of the middle class and the working class under, under Republican and Democratic administrations, the uh, 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 income of wealth, uh, the, 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 sorry, the income of middle class families increases twice as fast under Democratic administration compared to Republican administrations, and the income of working class Americans increases six times as quickly under Democratic as under Republican administrations. So Democrats have absolutely shifted to the right, but the Republicans have gone crazy. Right, and so there is still a, 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 but there's a causal relationship between the two, is what I'm suggesting. Yes, is absolutely. It's, it's giving more leash. Absolutely, I completely yeah. agree. Yeah. I completely agree. Others. When I when I think about the, the facts that you were talking about, the, the uh, most recent election, um, in which uh, Newt Gingrich made the, the free stand com president comment, and uh, Romney with his 47 percent comment, and, and John Sununu. John Sununu was uh, sidelined. Uh, for the duration of the campaign, after those specific comments, for those comments, Romney lost. Uh, Gingrich also was hit hard in the press over that. And, and then the comparison between the percentage of whites who um, voted for Nixon, say, in 72, versus the percentage of whites who voted for uh, Romney in the most recent election, 2012. I mean, isn't there a case to be made that the electorate is learning to detect these dog whistle signals, the, the racism of, uh, of the Republican Party? So, um, yes. And opportunistic politicians are learning to um, uh, craft new appeals that aren't recognized as racist, right? So, so if you think about Willie Horton, one of the striking things, uh, so Tali Mendelberg did this study of the, the Horton campaign ads, and one of, the, uh, one of the striking things she found was that there was a broad rejection of the idea that the Horton campaign was race baiting at all, that endured essentially for three years until internal documents from the Bush administration began to surface, right? And then, they, and then here are see, you know, these sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, here's the smoking gun where you've got these people who are saying, this is what we're doing, let's go out and do some race baiting. Okay, and they wrote it down, and now the press discovers it, and then they say, oh, whoa, well, you know, maybe, maybe that was about race. Right. And now, Horton is shorthand for race baiting. And you couldn't do that again. You could not use Horton again. On the other hand, and, and you've got in 2005, Ken Mailman apologizing for race baiting, and in and, and 2000, then Michael Steele apologizes for race baiting. So you, you've got this progression where the Republicans are, are, have been caught, and then they've apologized, and then they swore never to do it again, and then you know John Sununu sidelined after he injects these, com these comments into the national conversation. Right? So, so you, there is this complicated ballet in which people are making these racial appeals, and yet, if they be, if they, if they're surfaced too clearly, they distance themselves from them, and then they go on to something else, right? And so I really think it's like this dynamic is likely to continue. What can we say about the electorate as a whole? I, I want to acknowledge that the, that that the election of of the, our first black president is a is a monumental significance in terms of progress in race relations, right? It's, it's really amazing. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm. I think most of us, you know, whatever we say now, I think few of us before about November 3rd of 2008 really thought we were going to get a black president, right? I mean, it's just, it just seems so inconceivable. Okay, so, so this is really a monumental significance. On the other hand, we can see um, uh, that um, white support for Republicans is increasing over the Obama administration. So uh, when you look at 2008, the gap in the white vote for Obama versus McCain was 12%. In 2012, it was 20%. Right? And 59% of, of, of whites voted for Romney. Among those who voted for Romney, 90% were white. Among the Republican Party, Republican elected officials, 98% are white. This is really a party by and for whites. Right? And it's an open secret, and that support's increasing. Right, and now, and now we can talk about the House Republican districts and whatnot. So, 
these sorts of racial appeals, they're not going away. Sometimes they get recognized, but new ones emerge. I wouldn't suggest that they're going away. And, and also, I, I, I absolutely agree they are effective. But I, I want to, I'm just asking, over the course, over the, over the broad course of, say, 1972 now, couldn't you say that they are becoming, slowly becoming less effective? I mean, given the, given the percentage of whites who seem to be, who seem to respond to them in 72 versus right now, well, 70, 72 is a bit of a high water mark, but, but, so, uh, so, but, but, not, but not in any, so you, there's no sort of linear down, down sloping line, right? So, so you, you think about Clinton, for example, and, and he, so, I, so I've got all the figures in, in, in the appendix. Um, I, I can just run through them. Uh, so I'm going to run through very quickly the percentage surplus of white voters um, for Republican candidates versus for Democratic candidates. So, for example, Richard Nixon in 1968 has 16% more white voters uh, than, than, than Hubert Humphrey. Then he goes to 40% more. Then Gerald Ford has 4% more, partly because Gerald Ford declines to engage in race baiting, but Jimmy Carter does. Um, Ronald Reagan in 1980 has a 20% surplus. Then in 84, a 32% surplus. Then George Bush, a 20% surplus. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, then then uh, Bush, in his, uh, when he loses to Clinton, has a 2% surplus. Bob Dole has a 2% surplus. So it, re it really falls. Then it goes to 13% from 2000 for, for George W. Bush. He increases his support to 17%. It falls to 12% for McCain. It goes back to 20%. Right? So I don't, think there's, I don't think there's a comforting story here of whites learning to recognize racial appeals and gradually turning away. I think there's a comforting story here of a falling percentage of whites as a total part of the electorate. Right? And, so, and, and so the numbers run in a linear fashion. It runs from 90% in 1960 down to 72% in 2012. That's the comforting story if you're looking for one. So, so whites are 90% of the electorate in 1960, and they are 72% of the electorate in 2012. So, so there's your linear decrease. How much comfort and this so how much comfort should we take from this story? So what's happening among liberal pundits who are looking at dog whistle politics are they're saying it doesn't really matter because um, you know there aren't enough old white guys is, is translated into the demographics are changing by 2045. This is going to be a majority minority country. Whites are a smaller and smaller proportion of the country. And even though Romney bested Obama by 20 percent among whites, Obama still won the election. This sort of race baiting doesn't matter. And, I, and I've got two sort of simple basic responses. One, it matters enormously sure. if the white majority of this country continues to be racialized in its sense of politics and the state and of, the, of themselves, right? It matters tremendously. And it'll matter in terms of policy, especially when you think about the control of the House. But it'll also matter when you think about local politics. And I'd say North Carolina, and a state uh, you know, with the first, uh, first letter of W. And it could be Wyoming, but I would think it was Wisconsin. Right? I mean, so, so, so this is going to matter tremendously. Right? Even if Democrats keep winning, if whites continue to respond strongly to these sorts of racial appeals in a way that makes them quite supportive of anti-New Deal politics, this is going to be bad for everybody. Yeah. Second response. Um, White, as a category, is not stable. And white, as a category, has a tremendous potential to expand in a way that will keep this sort of politics vibrant for decades to come. And I'm especially worried about certain segments of the East Asian and Latino communities. Right. Right? And I, so the Republicans know they need to reach more minorities. But crudely, <laughs> they, they no, some do. Well, on the national level, well, so Republicans at the national level know they need to reach more minorities. Now, on the local level, they may be ensconced in safe districts, right? So the average uh, uh, demographics of a House Republican district is 75% white. So the average House Republican member, right? I heard it was 83. <laughs> I don't think so. But I'm, I could be wrong. But let's, I think it's 75. Okay. But, but average House Republican member, home district, 75% white. Okay, 
they don't need to reach out to minorities. But nationally, the Republican Party uh, understands that it, that it really start, needs to start doing this. So that you, you begin to, you have this window where they're talking about immigration reform. I think what they're going to very quickly realize is they don't need to reach out to minorities, they re need to reach out to a small subset of minorities. And that they can reach out to some minorities by appealing to them as fellow whites who themselves are threatened by these non-white immigrants, especially recent immigrants. And there's a history of this within the Mexican-American community. Um, according to the census now, um, uh, half of all Latinos think of themselves as white. Republicans, they don't need to reach all that entire half. They need 10 or 15 percent, yeah. right? I mean, I, I certainly, we'll see if that happens. I think the Tea Party is really getting in the way of, of the Republican leadership, who absolutely realizes that. But I, I don't know that the party is going to, you know, that party is going to wake up to this reality in a meaningful way because it is in the midst of its own civil war. I, I welcome that. That's great. So we'll I, I worry that they will because, and so this goes back to our, our, our earlier conversation. One of the ways in which dog whistle politics is evolving is by pushing non-white faces to the fore. So the sort of racism that we're seeing now, I'll talk about this more tomorrow, but the sort of racism that we're seeing now is not hate every black person, hate every brown person racism. It's a racism that subscribes to a common sense in which minorities are threatening, but in which the person holding that view also understands himself or herself as four square against racism. And she can't be more against racism uh, than when she supports a black candidate, right? A Herman Cain or Clarence Thomas, if you're coming from the law world, right? There is a move among conservatives to push black and brown people to the fore to espouse the same thing that George Wallace and the Barry Goldwater and Ronald Reagan were saying. In that context, and I, and I think a lot of those folks are Tea Party folks, in that context, they are, they are elated <coughs> to have minority members as long as they're repeating these same sort of cultural stereotypes about the threats posed by minorities. Right. And in a way, that's going to create space, even among these most racially agitated whites, to begin to accept other people you know, as equals, so long as they could participate in this cultural drumbeat of, of the threat that's really coming from minorities. Yeah. Not, not to be too downbeat about the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I think you offered here an answer to the question of what's wrong with Kansas. And, um, yes. To put it in, in other words, why do people vote against their own interests? Yes. Um, and, and I want to kind of add to what this gentleman asked, um, but I want to add um, the economic aspect and, and just to talk to what you were just talking about. Why do these brown and black people come to be part of that new white face, right? The, the face of the Republicans and, and even of the Tea Party is, um, I think, to a large degree because of economics. Because once they come to be rich or really hope mm -hmm. to be rich, they become white in a sense and, um, and they go against, if you will, the interests of the, the large group. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm concerned about the, um, the power of the kind of rhetorics, the, the dog whistle politics, um, in a country that is not only really still very much racist, but also because of these politics, because of the economic politics, is becoming less educated mm -hmm. That's right. and um, as you know the, the less educated you are the more prone you are to, to um, follow the dog mm -hmm. whistle mm -hmm. but also um, as poverty increases among whites too there is more of that um, willingness to Absolutely. to blame people of color and, and even towards fascism and we see it happening right now in <coughs> parts of Europe, definitely in Greece. And I don't know that we won't see it here. Right? So I would like you to add that aspect and, and tell us what you see when you look in your crystal ball um, yeah. about really the future of race relations and, and, and this country. Um, I think that internally rather than yeah, as an external 
Really terrific question. I, I, I like that you're, that you're asking to foreground sort of material interests. Um, in, a, in a way that's interesting, I think very few people are actually better off supporting the sorts of regressive politics that, that a Romney or, or a Goldwater uh, 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 suggest. I mean, I, mean, very, I mean, we're talking Koch brother type money before you're better off. You need so much money that you need to be able to insulate yourself from the rest of society. You don't just need enough money to where you can pay for your own education. I mean, you need your own uh, enough money so that you can be in a gated community and, and, and don't have to have contact with the people whose lives are being destroyed, right? So I, I really think very few people uh, can come to these sorts of politics alone through a sort of a rational evaluation of their material interests. I, I think ideology is doing a tremendous amount of work, right? And, and so the question becomes, why is this ideology, why is this narrative so powerful? And now, for, for some people, it's going to be sort of that Ayn Rand uh, ideology that's powerful, that the self-made person, um, uh, you know, um, how wonderful is it to think you're, that you're superior to everybody else and that they are mere moochers while you're self-made? I mean, this is the rhetoric that Romney also used, claiming that everything he had he made himself. I mean, it was, it was insane, but, but yet he was saying this quite seriously. So, but the other part of the ideology comes from crisis. The, the, the attraction of it comes from crisis. We really are a country in crisis, and, and a lot of people are really hurting. At, you know, they, they've um, uh, uh, people have lost their jobs. Um, uh, um, th they're hungry. Um, uh, you know, unemployment insurance is, is running out. People have used up their retirements. People have, there's been traumatic downward mobility from the middle class into the lower class. And in this context, people need a story about what happened to them and, and who's to blame. And I think that there's a way that FDR understood that in a way that contemporary liberals don't. Right? FDR understood people need someone to blame. And we shouldn't engage in sort of uh, demagogic scapegoating, but we ought to say, hey, <coughs> concentrated wealth, malefactors of great wealth, these people, when they pursue their interests selfishly, hurt the rest of us, we can't allow it. Right? We need that sort of a story. Democrats aren't offering it. And, and in the absence of a story, I, I was reading a couple of people, they said, they said uh, I think it was, resentment at pores a vacuum. People need to know who to hate. They need to know who to blame. And the Republicans have been consistently providing the answer. Blame minorities. Blame integration. Blame big government. So in that context, what do I think is, you know, you're, you're sort of saying, what, what do I think is going to happen? In the book, I offer a prescription for a sort of a renewed racial movement. I will call it a civil rights movement. And I can talk more about what this movement might look like. Maybe I'll talk about it tomorrow. But I don't think it's going to happen. And I don't think it's going to happen because so many whites have bought into uh, the sort of a, a colorblind ideology in which wanting to get beyond race, they refuse to talk about it. And if you don't talk about it, you can't see what's happening. And it will continue to happen, again, at this sort of punch, parry, kick, constant racial insinuation but never on the surface. So you have a sort of a cultural milieu in which whites insist that we're not going to talk about race, that we're post-racial, many liberals who are post-racial, and yet it's a milieu that's completely permeated by racial insinuation and is likely to get worse before it gets better. I think you mentioned earlier um, that in the 1960s, the ratio of a CEO salary to a normal person was like 40 to 1, right. and now it's like 350. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I think economics certainly has a play, and I'm just wondering where that fits in. Because so, it seems that in countries where there's a less of a gap, there's the happiness is better off than when there's a large gap, and it needs someone to blame in countries where there's such a significant gap between people's wealth. Um, it's more likely that you can have like dog whistle politics, where you're playing in people's emotions and targeting. It's not that the person's racist, but you're targeting emotions to, to win votes. Sorry, I missed that last one. I, I, my personal thought is, I, I, think, I don't think, it's not the racism, but the politics involved. So maybe a person is not racist, but you're appealing to their emotion, that who is to blame for my standard of living right now? It's someone else's fault. But, but why aren't they blaming the rich? 
And why don't the rich feel any sort of social responsibility? And that's, and that's where race comes in, right? So um, if you think about the New Deal, the New Deal was, was I don't want to say that the New Deal wasn't about race. The New Deal was highly racialized because it more or less excluded all minorities. So the New Deal is by and for whites. And in a context of a sort of a, a, an economic liberalism that's by and for whites, you had a broad consensus uh, that regulated capitalism and an activist government was the route to not only a prosperous middle class, but also a stable democracy. And this broad consensus was also shared by the CEOs. The CEOs developed, they had their own internal culture. So it's not just market mechanisms that's setting CEO uh, uh, salaries. It's also culture within the corporations. And they had a culture that said, we're all in this together. And so when they said things like, what's good for GM is good for America, it wasn't purely cynical. They really had a sense of, we're all in this together. And, it, and, and so on both levels, you had this sort of this consensus from, from the working class up and from the very rich down Regulated capitalism is central to the health of the, the society as a whole and to democracy. What begins to break that down? It's people on the fringe, like Barry Goldwater, who find race as a wedge issue. And, and then Lewis Powell and whatnot. As that begins to break down, you begin to get a narrative in which, from the point of view of the middle class, the working class, the greatest threat is minorities and not concentrated wealth. And that's one dynamic. From the point of view of the very rich, you get another dynamic, which is we don't have any social responsibility towards those people. Right? Think about how striking this is. This is Mitt Romney, who wants to be president of the country, saying, I don't have responsibility for half the country. That's an incredibly anti-social position for anyone to take, for anyone in the society to say, half the people in my society I don't care about, I write them off. But for someone who wants to be president, it's unbelievable. Right? What has allowed this? And I think that the same thing has happened at the level of CEOs. <coughs> they no longer have a sense of shared responsibility that extends to the workers. Now, part of this is race. I think part of it is, is globalization. Right? I mean, I, you know, uh, so my, my colleague John Powell says, the elite today, they don't have a race and they don't have a country. Right? Because all they have is levels of wealth that we have never seen before in the history of the world. Right? And they, they may travel to Davos, they may travel to Riyadh, they may travel to Manhattan, they may go to Tokyo. They don't have a race, they don't have a country. Right? And this helps also break down any sense of loyalty. Okay. Hi. I have a question. Um, so, uh, I can't um, recall all of the historical facts, but uh, I know that uh, at some point in the 70s, there was, uh, I think it's considered a large moment in like um, corporate businessmen like coming together and um, you think, you're thinking you're thinking of nineteen seventy one and Lewis Powell's memorandum to the Chamber of Commerce saying it's time to build think tanks. Is that right? Um, oh. I don't know about the think tank part, but it was in the seventies. <coughs> um, and so is is that really where like the big money comes into the story of wrecking like um, I guess I'm kind of just lost in how the racial appeals have combined with Yes. So, so, so I'm telling a story in which there's always been a sort of a burbling hostility to the New Deal. And, and some of it has been populist and some of it has been on the part of the very rich. In the 50s and the 1960s, who, what, did, what, did this, what form did this hostility to the New Deal take? Partly it took the, 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 the form of a fringe candidate like Barry Goldwater. Um, uh, it also took the form of support for fringe movements like the John Birch Society. And the John Birch Society is just craziness, right? So John Birch is saying things like the John Birch Society is saying things like fluoride in the water is a communist plot to brainwash Americans, or the federal government is, is, is uh, 
going to use Alaska as a repository to take all true patriots and put them in Alaska, right? Or they're saying things like, the federal government is already 90% controlled by communists and Eisenhower is a communist dupe. I mean, it's really crazy, loony stuff. Um, uh, the father of the Koch brothers, big funder of the John Birch Society. Right? So there's always been big money hostility to the New Deal, and there's been populist hostility too that plays into it. So those things aren't, they, they don't emerge out of racism. Now, it's also true that, that they were deeply racist, right? But, but it's not emerging out of racism. It's emerging out of partly a sort of grassroots paranoia and partly it's big business would rather control government than be controlled by government. But I think that's really at the fringes. What changes, there are a couple of things that changed in the 1960s, early 1970s. One, race emerges as an issue that is going to create broad popular support for an attack on the New Deal. Right? And, and when I say broad, I mean think about what the 1972 election looked like. Right? And that hadn't existed before. Not, I mean, JBS was, it was a joke. Right? Second thing that happens is you begin to get I'm talking about the, you know, 1971 and Lewis Powell, you begin to get a sense on the part of corporations um, that they are being persecuted and that they need to organize and that they need a more aggressive defense of conservatism. And race is going to be one of the ways in which they defend conservatism. It's not the only way. And, and these two movements effectively coalesce, I'd say, with the Heritage Foundation and Ronald Reagan. Right? So Heritage Foundation, one of these massively funded, very powerful think tanks, Upon Ronald Reagan's election, they come up with a 3,000-page book of policies they'd like him to enact, and a year later, they, they announce that he's enacted two-thirds of them. Reagan, on the first day of his administration, hands out a copy of the book to, which, hey, I heard it, what's a 3,000 page? Anyway, he, so he, each member of his cabinet gets a copy. Right? So, so these two movements come together. And it's not, I want to be clear, racism isn't driving this. Racism's just a tool. Manipulating racial hostility in the public is just a tool. What's driving this is A, politicians who want to get elected, and B, concentrated wealth who see that they can help politicians get elected if they'll help them reverse the New Deal state in a way that helps the very rich. And again, you know, I mean, all that sounds abstract and even conspiratorial, but if you, if you stop and say, well, what are the policies that these people want? What are the policies that Romney and, and Paul Ryan are espousing? Massive tax cuts for the rich, right? Slashed spending on social services and on government generally, which also has the effect of, well, that's incidental to what they really want, which is lower spending on government. Control of the state regulatory apparatus. It's not that they want deregulation. They want control of the regulatory apparatus because they want to control any sort of new competitors, right? Oil wants to control oil. You know, all these guys, environmental regulations, they want control. All of these policies, you can see that it's in the interest of concentrated wealth. And then you can see the policy, you can see the economic impact on the middle class. And, so that, and that's the story. I think that the organization she might be thinking of, the Business Roundtable Forums in 72, mm. the Trilateral Commission in 73 by David Rockefeller. So there's a series of these yes. initiatives that are responding in part to Powell. Yeah. yeah. So I've been thinking a lot about similar things, and just I'm curious to your reaction to what I see as the way that this works is that the middle and working class whites end up convinced that government, like my life sucks, is their experience, and increasingly it's getting worse, right? But the reason they can buy into this is because they see that government helps other people, not me, right? And so that's where they're actually losing the buy-in to the New Deal because the way the racial politics makes this make sense to them is that, you know, it, nothing in my life is going to get better by having more government programs because those government programs are for those people who are not me, yeah. right? And that's, uh, so to me that's, how the racial politics helps to undermine the middle class and, and get the middle and, and get Kansas to vote against itself. In a sense. Yeah. Oh, just really quickly on Kansas. So that's a reference to Frank Rich, Rich's book. Um, Thomas Frank. To Thomas Frank. Sorry, I was. Thomas Frank. Um, uh, what's the matter with Kansas? One of the remarkable things about about Frank's analysis is he actually says racism is no part of it. 
I, I otherwise think it's an excellent book. He's talking about the way in which the right uses cultural provocations, asks people to vote against social liberalism when in fact what they're voting against is economic liberalism, right? So I, I really like the book, but he completely misses um, the sort of racial component. Um, and Pilar, in terms of your story, I think your story is correct if you understand it as a sort of a mythical claim rather than, than a, a, a material yeah. claim, right? Like, yes. like when you Absolutely. look at the amount of funding that actually went to blacks and browns, yeah. and someone had this great study and they said, if you took all the money in the Great Society programs that went to blacks and browns and instead gave it to whites, it would have increased their, their net income or whatever by like less than 1%. It wasn't that anybody was actually losing out big resources, but they had a strong perception that things were being taken from them and given to these other un undeserving others, right? And, and, and it was a story, I, I mean, it, the, 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 uh, for me, the perfect example of this is Ronald Reagan saying, someone standing in line buying T-bone steaks with food stamps and you're waiting in line to buy hamburger. You, the long-suffering, hard-working, tax-paying white person, are getting no help from the government but instead, all of, the, all of your work is going to be to pay for these guys who are lazy and don't work and are doing better than you, right? And that, there's no basis in reality to that, but it had very strong racial resonance. Well, and, and that goes along with the fact that all those southern states that are really Republican are also, they are net gainers in exactly. terms of social, the, you know, the taxes they pay in versus the money they get back. Right, right, yeah. right. And, and then you read these stories of, of Tea Party members who are really mad at government because they're unemployed and government's helping them. And you're like, well, wait a minute. I mean, what's, how, do you, how do you explain that? Why would somebody hate government when unemployed they turn to government for assistance? And it's not, and I want to be clear, it's not, that they're, it's not that they're saying I hate government and they're not acknowledging that they're being aided by government. They're saying I hate government because government's helping me while I'm unemployed. And you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense until you back up and start to think, well, for 50 years they've heard the message that the people government helped are welfare queens. Mm -hmm. And now they're welfare royalty themselves. And it kills them, right? They need the help, but they've come to believe that the only people who, who get help from government are chiselers and cheats and loafers. And so now they've got to square that and they say, I need help and I hate it. And I'm so mad at government for helping me. And I think it's the racial narrative that, 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 that sort of explains that anger. So we should probably end here. Well, right? they get governmental support. Exactly. For the plantations or whatever that's right. called now. Right, with the corporations, yeah. Yeah. So we're a little bit over time, so we should probably call it quits. But a reminder that tomorrow is the second chapter. I don't know if the actual second chapter of the book, but um, in 810. Oh, here. Me. It's right here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Same right here. Same time, 4 o'clock. Thank you.